Well, let's get started with the Thursday pivot. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lori Power and I'm a group benefits specialist. So benefits are my only business. We strategically design effective benefit plans at the right price using the right providers for our client base. Our goal in that after sale market is to be consistently responsive. And that's how we started the Zoomcast in the first place is to be consistently responsive to our clients. There's a lot of shifting going on in business right now, a lot of questions, and we wanted to create a venue where we could provide those answers and interact with people and keep that networking going. So welcome to The Shift Show. Today, we are pleased to have Jonathan Gallo from Gallo and Company Chartered Accountants. And he's going to take us through accounting and payroll common problems, issues, concerns, especially now with all this government funding, tax season being moved to the fall instead of the spring. And we're going to put him on the hot spot to lead the conversation. John, if you can take a moment and it, tell us a little bit about your company and how you work, how long you've been going, your expertise. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lori, for setting us up. Really uh, honored and pleased to be here. So hopefully we can have a, a great dialogue. Um, so I'm John Gallo. Uh, we're, we started this, uh, this firm in 2012, coming from, nas from national firms. Uh, we have two offices, about 30 staff, one office in Shirt Park, another one just west of downtown Edmonton. Um, we're filled with maybe eight, nine CAs or CPAs. Uh, three of us are in-depth tax professionals, so um, we spend a lot of our time uh, doing lots of reorgs or focusing on, on on private own, private owner, private managed businesses and their tax problems and providing solutions for them so that they can, uh, they can not grind down their working capital or their personal capital to help uh, the federal government deal with their problems. Um, and we have, we have CBV and of course we have an audit and insurance team. So a full service uh, regional firm here in the Edmonton area. Excellent. Well, you and I have talked in the past, when it comes to benefit plans, payroll always comes up and, and what to be deducted off employees. What are the most common questions that you get from, from your client base when they introduce a benefit plan or even if they introduce another program and we're talking about taxable benefits over non-taxable benefits, what are work-related expenses versus uh, non-work-related expenses that, that they may wanna to try to put through? What are some of the common questions that, that you answer with your client base? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot there. I think the, the first thing that we talk about when it comes to, to, to the benefits piece, uh, which is, is kind of a very kind of clear issue is around, you know, uh, things like disability uh, insurance and critical illness insurance and the kind of informing and, 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 you know, you do a really great job of this, but informing the, the owner about, you know, the benefits of, you know, what the employer should pay for versus what the employee should pay for because there's much better tax outcomes. Uh, it's, it's a win-win for both the employer and the employee if you choose certain way. So, for example, um, not, 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 let's, not, let's put critical illness aside because that's a lot, that's a plan. Sometimes that's used as a planning tool for owners, but disability insurance, um, Oftentimes, employees, you know, would rather not get the deduction taken off their pay for disability insurance, um, and you know, essentially the employer pays for it. The problem generally with that is if the employer pays for disability insurance and the individual then has to claim the disability, that claim is now taxable to the individual. And I always tell the, the owner, whether it's for themselves or for their employees, the way you need to communicate this to your staff is if the disability premium is $25 or $50 a month, uh, they generally won't miss that off their pay. Like it, it's not going to change their lifestyle at all. But what will change their lifestyle is the difference between a $3,000 a month check for disability insurance that is taxable or a $3,000 check that's not taxable. That's a, almost depends on, you know, I think that could be a 30 to 40% swing in their take home income. And that will significantly change their life. And even, you know, for, for say high, high income earners like a doctor or a dentist, you know, a, a $5,000 a month disability insurance, um, you know, 
I don't know what that would be a year, but call it 150 bucks a month type thing. Uh, they're not going to miss that when they're making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. But I can tell you, if they're taking sixteen thousand dollars home, ta not taxed, uh, a year, they can live off that. It's not going to be their traditional lifestyle, but they can live. That's probably equivalent to ninety thousand dollars a year uh, of taxable income. But if it's five thousand a month taxed, they're making thirty grand a year, and that's a huge swing in, in their personal income. So I think it's a really important educational piece to talk talk to uh, talk to the to employees about and why disability uh, and life insurance. And then same goes with life insurance for employees. For, for owners, it's a little different. There are some nuances around life insurance uh, that, that, that the company could pay for it. There's really three options when it comes to life insurance and walking through the owner and the benefits carrier on, on what would be one of the three options. That is, you know, uh, they pay for it individually. The company pays for it, but it's not deducted. Uh, on the tax return. So it's using corporate dollars, but you don't get the deduction. And the third option is uh, the company pays for it and there is a deduction because of the business purpose for that life insurance. Um, and, and we basically want to make sure that, you know, from a corporate side, so option one, option two and three, we're, we're trying to use the capital dividend account to, to unfortunately, if there was a death, that they could pull that money out tax-free into the personal hands or into the estate or trust of, of the deceased member. For an employee, option two, three really isn't that relevant. Like, excuse me, I don't have COVID. And uh, <laughs> option one really is, is that, it, it, you know, the employee isn't taxed on life insurance policy. And there's very few cases where I think an employee who has no ownership, the company should ever pay for life insurance. In fact, I can't really think of one offhand outside of perhaps a very dangerous job where, uh, um, maybe the deep sea fishermen or something like that, where, you know, life expectancy might be short. Um, well, even on the on the group plan, that's very very seldom that we'll ever um, recommend that the employer take care of those costs. When Margaret and I have talked about this in the past, um, you know. It's hard to talk tax sometimes to business owners. I'm amazed at how many people really don't understand and get the value of non taxable versus taxable and the the difference in their income between the two what's your best um uh best way of explaining that to a business owner you know uh, the, the the best way is really kind of you know with life insurance i i you know and because a lot of times we'll see that life insurance policies were put together in sort of a haphazard way. And, you know, the company may pay for it, but the policy is owned by the individual, the beneficiary, the individual, the company, nothing makes sense. And it really, it really threatens the, 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 the tax advantages of, a, of, of life insurance. You run the numbers and say, what's your spouse going to do? Or what, your what are your children going to do if this is a structured rate? How is the debts of the corporation? And if, if the, the company becomes insolvent, Where's the legacy, right? Really trying to hit the emotional sides. I mean, the numbers are as, as, as clear as day, um, but it's the emotional side that really kind of forces them to think about, oh, I don't want to deal with this, it's just account stuff, or, or, you know, it's the books, I, uh, you know. Uh, and you say, well, sure, but, you know, we had a case, uh, not maybe it's two years old now, where, you know, we had a client, in the early 30s, couple kids, uh, husband and wife, and unfortunately, the husband uh, in an accident uh, flipped something and, and passed away. And thankfully, there's a five million dollar life insurance policy, properly structured through a reorg that we did, where it got paid out tax free to the spouse. And, and, and you know, you can't replace the husband, but you certainly can help the the, the journey forward for the children and, and and the surviving spouse member. So I think it's the emotional side that really. Otherwise, all they see is numbers, right? And if you're talking, you know. Um, big insurance policies, where maybe it's a permanent insurance or, or it's a, a, some sort of, you know, there's an investment product or where, you know, the premiums could be 25000 a month. Um, you, you know, you really got to talk to them through the emotional side because the numbers can be quite high. And though there's a number that makes it make sense from purely an analytic perspective, uh, in times like this, people get stressed about the analytics and they go back to the emotional side. So you got to remind them about that. Yeah, Tim has a question for you. Go ahead, Tim. 
And just a reminder to anybody, you can, you can add your questions to the chat bar. This is your 30 minutes with John Gallo. So lead away. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, John, how have the, uh, the conversations been structured with, um, I suppose, the business owners and their accountants uh, post TOSI? So are they more, I, I suppose, are they more open to having a conversation surrounding something that's, you know, exempt from tax, like a life insurance policy? Or how have you seen the conversation really shift, um, I guess, suppose, in that regard? And also with... Um, I'm not quite sure if there's been any kind of real taxable changes for insurance tracking shares when you're implementing like corporate owned life insurance, but could you touch on that if anything has changed? Yeah, I think the, the first question around toast, so tax, tax on split income for those that aren't, aren't familiar with it really is a rule that came in kind of mid 2016 with the new liberal government around, um, Prior to TOSI, we could issue out dividends in any manner whatsoever to shareholders of the company without any justification of a reasonability test, which has always been with, on salary, but never on dividends. So TOSI, there's about 11 exemptions within TOSI that you can kind of work your way around. Um, specifically to insurance, um, though, though there's, a, there's a tool to help with, with the TOSI issues around insurance, uh, it certainly hasn't been uh, clearly linked together. Those, the conversation hasn't been hasn't been a natural fit with with uh, TOSI and insurance specifically. But I think there are some 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 opportunities there. But I wouldn't say that would be the number one uh, solution to get around TOSI because um, I think you'd have to go into some sort of leveraged plan and. and I mean, I can't speak for other accounts, but generally, if you start going to leverage insurance plans or, or arbitraging interest rates on insu uh, with insurance between personal and corporate, you're getting some pretty high risk. Uh, I guess it depends on who you're talking to, but it's 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 it's, it's not it's not something that's intuitively uh, designed to resolve the toast issue. It, it's it, those sorts of policies would be designed to suck retained earnings out of the company. Uh, but at a very high risk rate. I think perhaps maybe, I mean, and we, can only, we, we only have to, I guess it's a crystal ball issue, is we haven't seen any court cases with TOSI, right? So, I mean, TOSI was all the rave in 16 and 17, and guys were, guys and gals and accounts were selling a bunch of reorgs and plans and trying to solve that problem. But we haven't seen a court case yet, and we don't know where the threshold is for TOSI. So, you know, if you ask me personally, I think your threshold's probably... Eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. So you could you could probably issue a dividends to to the inactive spouse up to eighty thousand dollars with very little justification, and they're not going to come at it because just the, the punitive effort to go after that is um, isn't worth their time. So uh, and then if you think if it's eighty to one hundred thousand dollars, and why that? Because we've seen court cases around salary that the judge has said, well, that seems pretty reasonable for someone doing very little directorship and providing strategic guidance, right? So uh, that takes care of probably arguably 95% of people that are, are issuing out uh, income to their active spouse. So there's a very small uh, set and group uh, that, that would be pushing out more than that uh, on a regular basis anyways. And maybe on a similar business, that'd be different but you can structure things to avoid TOSI at that point. So uh, that's a long thing to say, not horribly, um, hasn't been a big conversation. To your second point, no, nothing has changed that I'm aware of. And nor will that be a priority, I think, for, for finance. That leads us into John talking about perhaps CRA's uh, backlash after all of the government uh, programming in the extension of the subsidies till to December. If we're going through business right now, what's your strongest recommendation for recovery, especially for those businesses with employees who have taken some of the some of the government programming? What do you mean in terms of recovery? Recovery of the business or well taking care of the tax implications that go that have gone along with these government programming um what what kinds of 
how can we avoid the pitfalls if there are any and if there aren't then that's that's wonderful that's a that's a nice sweet easy answer but if there are what are the top recommendations for for businesses to to get through yeah i mean this is this is maybe moving a little bit away from the payroll stuff and that that is fine um so what if we talked about the the, C, the CU, the, uh, the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, and, and, and you know, it's been in the news this week because they changed the rules on a go forward basis July onward, uh, and pushed the rate out till Christmas with, an, with a, a de elevating scale based on revenues and, and maximum amounts um, attributable. I think, you know, in our community, we actually don't think the CRA is going to challenge um the wage subsidy that much in fact it's been undersubscribed from a budgetary perspective um and the reason it's been undersubscribed is because uh people aren't hiring employees back and that's very concerning to the government so they're actually trying to encourage more people to go on to the wage subsidy uh because that's that, that that means if you're if you are applying for the wage subsidy you have employees right and you have less revenue which from a macro perspective, means the economy is starting to spin up again. Um, so we think if they're going to audit anything, if they're going to focus on anything, it'll be two factors. Uh, wage subsidy in relation to the owner manager. Like, so was there any kind of, you know, uh, you know, witchcraft going on where, where the owner wasn't uh, a, a, an employee and all of a sudden they are and it, it, that there's been some wages there. Um, and or the movement of revenue between related parties to be qualified for the wage subsidy. So those are really going to be the only, only two issues that we think they're going to go after. And more likely it's going to be the, the related party group stuff because I think that's a really easy way for people to manipulate uh, their revenues to be qualified for the wage subsidy. So I would say if you're on the wage subsidy and you're not, you don't have a big corporate group of entities, you probably have very little uh, to worry about. And if you, uh, as an owner, were on a salary or T4 before, uh, and you're on the before March 15th, you probably, your company probably will not, not be looked at at all. What's interesting is that there are a significant number of our clients and talking to other accounts that they've qualified for the wage subsidy with very little sort of creativity. Um, and their net profit is, is, is actually equal to or greater than uh, what it was the same period last year. And why is that? Because, uh, you know, by March 29th, they cut all their, all their kind of discretionary costs. They focused on their gross margin. Uh, there's been no golf tournaments, no galas, no quasi-marketing personal things that um, they, they would have went on that would have actually eating up a lot of cash on their income statement. So they're actually performing pretty well, even with the drop in revenue. And so their gut is, oh my gosh, I'm going to get audited because my net profit is equal to or, or higher than last year. And I got all these subsidies. Well, if you think of the math, I mean, uh, on a very simple business, wages are what, 30, 40% uh, of your top line revenue. If your growth, gross profit is 35% of revenue, um, you know, broad terms, one would expect you to have a higher profit if you've got a 75% wage, particularly if a lot of your employees are low, are, I won't say low, but you know, at that 50 to $60,000 salary where a majority of their wage is being, being, being reimbursed to you. Um, you now, if you have lots of employees making 200,000, your wage subsidy is, is, much, is not as relevant to their overall wage, but if you have lots of employees at 50, 60, 70,000, and you got 75% of the first $52,000 reimbursed. That's a lot of a lot of profit going back down. You have to make three times that in revenue to break to be at the same level. So you we're going to see. Uh, we're telling clients, don't be surprised if your net income is equal to or greater than. You're going to pay. You know, you have to pay tax on that for sure. But don't be surprised. Don't think that automatically triggers you for an audit. So don't be shy taking the wage subsidy. Uh, we should take it. If you qualify, uh, there's nothing honorable in not taking it. And then I say, I say to clients, and I had, you know, just before this meeting, I said, you know, if you really want to be, you know, Johnny Good, Good Shoes about it, 
Spend that additional money on, on, on a probably one or two areas to grow your business, IT and getting better at the web and, and, and you know, uh, business to business uh, web sales or web interaction and marketing. So reinvest that money to hire more people. So if you're taking a wage subsidy and your employee account goes up, they're not even going to be touching. Now you have to be fiscally responsible about your bottom line, but this is the time to take a swing at bringing back uh, employees in different roles or new employees in, in, in roles that you might have, you know, if you think of marketing, you hired a marketing company and their average bill out rate for, for Google people is 150 bucks an hour. You can bring someone in at, you know, 60,000 a year, which is, is, you know, 20 bucks an hour or 25 bucks an hour. Um, you know, you save, you know, five times that, that, that expense and you get this and if you can get the same output, you're winning. So, um, reinvesting that into, into people would be very, very interesting. In terms of some of the other subsidies, um, you know, we do think CERB will be highly audited if we know it's been abused. Uh, the question is how easy will they be able to pick, pick out those abuses? Um, so if, if, you, if you as a business owner have made deals with your client, or sorry, with your staff, uh, and, and, and they've gone on CERB and there's been some, maybe some loosey-goosey arrangements, uh, you might be concerned about that. And most likely the liability isn't with you, it's with the individual. But the problem is if they're a good employee and they're stressed and they have to pay CRA back, whose door are they going to knock on? They're going to come to the boss's office and say, listen, we had this conversation. Now I got, you know, an $8,000 tax bill to pay back my sir. What am I going to do? And you're going to say, well, it's an employer's market out there, or I really value this, this employee and I don't want them to be stressed and, something's going to happen, right? It's much like, you know, benefit, you know, taxable benefits that haven't been properly recorded on vehicles. Uh, when the individual gets audited and they get a reassessment of five, six, seven thousand um, dollars you know, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. An example where the employer hasn't stepped up on that, particularly they, they, they value the employee because they know it was their fault or there was, there wasn't proper communication and the employee, employee was, wasn't properly reported it. That, uh, that's certainly a good segue to, uh, you know, you need somebody to do the policies and procedures. Hey, Marie. Um, the, uh, that does lead me into asking, the, the longer this goes on, and, and um, to your point, the extension of these programs means that people are going to continue to work from home. So it's no longer a temporary measure. It's going to be a long-term measure word is, is that a lot of employees are not interested in coming back to work. So take us through reimbursements and allowances, if you would, and in the interest of time, um, we have simply five minutes left, but those home office expenses and how a company can look at planning out for 2021 budget wise, what's going to be acceptable and how, how to best prepare for that. Yeah, I, I think that from an employer's perspective, when it comes to employees, that's going to be the biggest sort of pain uh, point, uh, you know, coming around the calendar year end, because really there's two options, right? One is you provide a reasonable allowance to your employees for a home office. And then of course you issue them a T2200 statement of employment declaration, which is a three page form that the employer has to fill out or control, or sometimes the accounts fill out. Um, and then the employee can then use that uh, report the allowance as income that will show up on their T4 in a special box on T4 and then they will they will pay tax on that allowance and then of course they will can then offset that revenue against any expenses that were specifically outlined in the T2200 so as an employer that's a lot of paperwork that you have to prepare for each one of your employees um, and then they have to do their own taxes we often see employees get frustrated with that because now they have this new form they have to fill out a T2200, which means they're generally going to start going to accountants, which is going to increase the cost of their, of their compliance for April, which frustrates them further. So we're advising our clients, you know what, set up a policy where um, your employees can, can be reimbursed for legitimate and real expenses related to their, related to their home office, provided they provide the receipts, you can set that policy to whatever you deem is reasonable, $500, $1,000 per employee. 
and they provide you those receipts, you reimburse them. That's not taxable to them, and it's deductible on your uh, for the corporation. So the corporation really uh, isn't out anything. They're, they still are going to give that allowance anyways, and it avoids all the all the compliance work on the employee side. So it becomes a lot less um, a lot less administrative burden for the employee, and you don't risk you know annoying people. And everyone likes a tax free thing. The only downside of that is it has to be a real expense. So sometimes, you know, uh, an allowance doesn't have to be a real expense, and that's why it's taxable, and they can, then the employee can offset it against the real expense. Um, but I think, uh, quite frankly, there isn't anyone who is, is, is doing significant work from home. Uh, you know, $1,000 is probably easily justifiable from an expense perspective on, on that. I suppose if they didn't have the receipts, you could give, they can do a stat deck with, uh, if you had someone in your office that could do stat decks. Um, we don't think that'll be audited that much, to be honest. Uh, but you know, particularly if it's a reimbursement, the higher risk is the T twenty two hundreds for individuals is probably the number one uh, audit reassessment for individuals. Whereas employee in, reimbursed employee expenses barely ever gets touched, uh, so it's not a, it's not a big concern at all. Um, so we think that that's that's going to be the number one thing that pe and no one's going to deal with that until. You know, probably the second week in February when T4s have to have to go out and employees are starting to get really frustrated with it. We think is, the, there, uh, is there a third option where the, there is no allowance or reimbursement and the employee undertakes expenses on their own and then just claims them independently without any sort of input from the organization? That would be denied. Is that right, eh? You can't. You can't. You, you can't. Um, you can't deduct uh, in employment expenses unless you have a T2200. It, it's, it's what triggers the allowance to go. Gotcha. So they would just what, if, what, what if there is no allowance from the organization? What if an employee feels they need a, a tower for their, for their monitor and the employer isn't willing to do that, but still makes, undertakes that expense? It, that, that's fine. The employer still has to issue a T2200. Thank you. And now... We're coming down to the last couple of minutes. Just uh, I want to make sure that everybody is taking the opportunity um, in the chat bar. If you're if you're comfortable there, please put your most burning questions so we can get that to to John before before time runs out. This is the opportunity to ask an expert. So feel free to reach out. John, talking about um, expenses for employees. You and I have spoken about education expenses. And now with so much available online and employers taking advantage of increased education for their, their uh, employees, how does that run when it comes to tax and, and claims? Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, under the Income Tax Act Section 15, any reasonable, any reasonable expense incurred by the business or an income is deductible, including education. We generally find that uh, any, you know, it's funny because if, if the education uh, paid by the employer is, isn't to an educational institution like a university, CRA doesn't seem to question it. But the minute an employer pays for a university degree, they, the CRA will such a question, what's the benefit? Is there a greater benefit to the employee as an individual and not as an employee? And then they start, and then they perhaps, and, and they'll be more often not uh, charge the employee with a taxable benefit for which they've never remitted for, so they have a big tax, tax outcome. But if it's any sort of non-university or degree granting or, or college granting outside of trades specifically, but like, so if, if you send your marketing person to get a psychology degree or even your HR person to get a psychology degree, they most likely will be found to be deemed offside. But if they take these certifications in their in their in their job title, doesn't matter how much you spend, it's most likely justifiable, hundred percent. Particularly if they're not related to the owner of the business. Tim has a follow up question to to Murray. Could there not be in addition to the PSA to allow employees certain specific works? Additions without a T twenty two hundred having to be issued. I think you answered your own question. Um, you know, I, I guess it's possible. I mean, you know, the, the way these things work is it starts with a desk audit with a level one CRA agent. 
and the reassessment to the employee saying they owe thousands of dollars. That's how it starts, right? So my, my question to you, it takes 10 minutes to fill out a T2200. They're never challenged by CRA. So why even bother stressing out the employee? Excellent. Well, thanks so much for everybody coming by. Special thanks to you, John. I appreciate it. If you can stick around for a couple of minutes afterward, that would be great. I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time. Remember the challenge. Pick somebody in the room. Grab their name. Brenda was kind enough to throw her information up there. Uh, Bob and, and Murray and, and Melanie put all their information up ahead of time. Take the time to reach out, connect on LinkedIn, and have that virtual coffee. Make it worth your while. This is where business is going to grow for the next time period going forward. If you've liked coming out and talking about all this shift and pivoting and how we're going to move the business to success, I hope you'll come back again next week. We're going to have Tara Hamlin and Patty McDonald, who are partners at Bishop McKenzie, and we're going to talk about all this legal shift. You know, there's a whole lot going on. So if you're interested or you have a friend who might be interested in asking a question for a lawyer, then by all means, come on out and you'll be able to find that on Eventbrite. So take that information, reach out, and please accept this as my virtual handshake to you until we can meet again in person.